Welcome back, John. How are you doing? Hey, it's great to be back. <laughs> well, just to inform the people, uh, you know, on, on the, the several shows that we've done, in the, in the description of each of the videos, there is a series of links. So you can go to John's website and take a look at his periodical. He does readings. So please click the link. The, the, the links are in the description of this video and all the videos that we've been doing. And, um, you know, please go to John's website and uh, take a look at what he has to offer. So, again, thank you again for coming on to the show. And, you know, we've been doing a series on this Israeli conflict that's been going on. Um, and I guess we want to start off with some feelings that I've been having. And maybe yes. you can interpret what I've been feeling. Okay. And I've been saying these on a, a few of my shows. So, you know, people this are somewhat. This is the first time I've heard it on our show and for everybody to know we were talking about before the show started and i said oh let's start with this because this is right at least if you've heard it on other shows i'm going to probably give it a, a unique angle right right okay it, maybe you just say i'm crazy which is fine it's okay <laughs> all right so it's okay i'm great. Been, i'm a madman too <laughs> so i've been having this feeling of of uh, a, a dark cloud over my self uh, for also my family members and close friends, all right? There's this dark cloud that started on August 1st, and I kept on seeing a number 1130, so November 30th of this year, okay? And this is way before the crisis with Israel and, and the Palestinians, all right? Before the rockets started flying and all that way, you know, be, and that that's feeling, even started before uh, Rosh Hashanah. And we had a show and we talked about Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of the shofar that couldn't happen on the Sabbath, which is, right, know. and this, right, right. And then all of a sudden, you know, I even told you about, you know, the, the I think it was, it was, I think it was Yom Kippur where, where I put the, 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 uh, um, the umbrella over the rabbi when I was, it was raining. And he wasn't feeling well because he had long COVID. I put the, the umbrella over the rabbi when I was walking home. And I wasn't supposed to do that because you're not supposed to put a tent they over it. About this. <laughs> right, right, right. right. No, so, I, so I cursed, I, I kind of sort of cursed the rabbi on Yom Kippur, <laughs> on Yom Kippur night, you know. So, so um, you know, so I just, and then fast forward that through Sukkis, and then I did the the shaking of the little love, and then smashed it on the ground at the last the last day to silence Satan or silence the the great prosecutor, and then that goes right into Simkas Torah and Simkas Torah in Israel. The day of Simkas Torah w was when um, October seventh happened. So there was this kind of a culmination of things that were happening. This dark feeling of change and, and and there's a negative force coming over people that I knew and within my own life and within my own family right and um and I define it as the ones that sense it are are called the sensitive I call them the sensitives for lack of a better term right whereas this dark cloud that comes over and it seems to pass over the sensitives after 1130 but the sensitives still have the the residue of negative happening to them but this cloud is magnified with the wider world all right and i've been feeling this since august mm -hmm. all right now I learned about three days ago the, the publishing of the Tanya, which is a Hasidic text, text by the Alter Rebbe, you know, in Ukraine, or depending on where the border was for Russia and Ukraine at the time. But, but you know, in that area. You were saying was, it was uh, 1700s? Uh, seven, 1796. Oh, of well, that's... Kislev, of Kislev, oh, oh. of, of uh, uh, 19th of Kislev. Okay, Ukraine, Ukraina was not even existing really then. It was part of the Ruski Mir, 
the greater Russian world, which is kind of ironic mm -hmm. because we're seeing a return of the Rushkimir at the end of this war, which is coming soon. That's the other subject to deal with today. But the um, but that would have been at the peak of Catherine the Great's uh, rule. And she was very much involved in colonizing after the Turks were defeated and all that area was returned to uh, Kiev Rus and all that was returned. So, mm -hmm. well, that's, that's good. <laughs> but, yeah, but so there's there. I've been always saying that there's been this connection between Ukraine and Russia and the Bel Shem Tov and the whole Hasidic movement and that the, the, there, there, it's almost like a charging the Sephiroth with the, with pieces of Ukraine going back to, to Russia and there's this kind of charge effect that's happening. Now, when this when this cloud passes over and it's magnified over the rest of the world, that starts on December 1st. Well, it so happens this year because of the lunar calendar, it, it, it changes the dates matching a certain date of the solar calendar. It happens to be December 1st, okay? Now you gotta remember, you, Jewish calendars really start at night at sundown not during the mm. day so, you know so mm. it's you know so when people Thanks plug it in me. you gotta <laughs> you know you gotta put when you plug that all in you gotta mm. assume all right when sundown and so it happens to be december 1st it's december 1st is it coincides with this 19th of kislev which is the day 1796 of when the tanya was published major hasidic text major i mean it's right up there with the zohar and the Sefer Yitzira, right? There's three major texts there, but Tanya is a big one, right? And this is like this influx. I, the only way I can describe it, I said it on the show the other night, it's like a an influx of energy and that there are going to be the sensitives that can absorb this and the ones that are not prepared cannot. And their, their vessels fracture. So if you're spiritually prepared, you can, what is fluxing in December, even though the cloud was negative, it's almost like a kind of a realization you have to do repentance or look into your life and how to improve your life, mm -hmm. right? And there seems to, I feel as though there is a flux, it's an energy flux or a, or a, a vibration of some sort that's going to flux starting on December 1st. And for some people, it's going to be positive because they can they can get this this uh, capture it, and there are going to be other people that are either oblivious and it's going to be very negative, or even even worse, you know, they're very negative people. It'll it'll magnify their negative their their negative attributes, yeah. and so um, I found out that Hanukkah <laughs> it gets even crazier. Depending on the year, Hanukkah is either at the beginning, you know, of December or near the end of December. Sometimes yeah. it coincides with with Christmas, right? Yeah. So this year, I believe it starts out either the, the fifth or the sixth. Wow. And Kislev, the month, is really important because of the the publishing of this Hasidic text. All right. So the whole month is considered very um, important in terms of trying to get spiritual energy. So that means that, you know, roughly these months are like 28, 29 days with the lunar calendar. So on the 19th of Kislev, you have another nine or 10 days of this flux that I've been sensing. So I, the way I interpret this is that the flux starts and that there, there's an additional sets of fluxing that is taking place from the light this is going to be really esoteric what I'm going to say, but I, I think you'll follow mm -hmm. the light that God concealed is the flux that's going to come. Mm -hmm. And this is coinciding with lighting of the menorah. Right. right. So, and I feel as though it, this is not a good thing. In the short, in the short term, it's not a good thing. In the long term, I think it is a good thing. Yes, and there are going to be people that can harness it mm -hmm. and benefit from it, and it'll be good in the long run. But there's going to be a tumultuous charge thing that's happening. Yes. Travail. So, 
So that's where I'm at with this. <laughs> you take, okay. take, take, well, take it. Well, it's very take interesting it. to frame this in a Jewish scholarly context because uh, there's, um, well, I'll just start with one piece and we'll get them slowly. So because a lot of things went sparking at, inside me while you were uh, sharing all of that. Um, it's there is, you know, I've been talking on the shows about how Pluto is returning to its natal birth position uh, and it's going, it just went through its um, sixth pass right during when this war started just a few days after it it started on the 10th this final swing of um pluto over its natal position in the united states is very key because we are the the thing is backing up israel to do whatever it does good or evil you know so it's a very you know big brother of israel is is going through this death of the hegemon and travail to the rebirth of kind of coming back to America, just being America and not being an imperium. A Pax Americana has been a pox on everybody else for the last 30 years. And finally there's choices and a lot of the world is leaving the United States. And the situation since this war started uh, on the 7th of August has been um, a another great wrecking ball moment, just like all the, the seven, eventually seven stages of this that I've been talking about on other shows. So this is related to this. Um, and uh, to unpack it is uh, just for some of the people who haven't seen the other shows. I'll just say quickly that in astrology, when you're uh, Pluto's one orbit contains the entire history of the United States. It's uh, it's birth to today. And it is that orbit is dying and is renewing its orbit in a process in astrology that has uh, seven passes because it's a very far distant planet. It's a planet that rules epochs and ages. And so this age is ending. The first American age is 248 years long. And so it's touching. It started touching and influencing uh passing over its natal position which is called a return and it can be a very important thing karmically in the case of judicial astrology which is the you know, reading of nations uh, and as well as in personal astrology this birth uh, position of pluto in capricorn 27 degrees uh, is is very key to its whole establishment to the architecture that created a modern democracy through its uh, bill of rights and the constitution and and then what happens now is uh, we are, like I said, the 10th of October was the sixth pass. Now, the first pass was when Biden was inaugurated as president. So that gave birth to his first term. And it's been kind of downhill ever since. You know, in the, in the, uh, there was the disaster of Afghanistan. <laughs> then there was the war in Ukraine and now this. And um it and it has very powerful pot potentials with it because what people are missing and my next set of whole prophecy report is going to really focus on this everybody is fixating on what's happening in israel but what's not being reported is the increase of violence across the middle east of shia uh, militias and other and sunni militias um, attacking american bases and a lot of people are getting wounded in American bases from sources that I have. Well, Larry Johnson, of, um, who's a very good CIA source, uh, is a former CIA uh, person. Uh, he, uh, you know, the, his sources in the CIA, he's retired, have saying a lot of the hospitals are filling up with American wounded. And um, they're trying to keep a lid on it because they want to keep this from exploding. The... So, so that's happening. So what's really, what really is happening that everybody's going, look at this, look at this, Israel. But what you ought to be looking at is that, which is America getting ready to potentially go to war with Iran. The Eisenhower and its task force is, is to carry a strike force is now in the, around the Gulf of Oman. So it's right at the mouth of, well, far enough away not to be hit by cruise missile, but they're out there in the Arabian Sea at the Gulf of Oman waiting. I think the Bataan uh, helicopter or, uh, expeditionary carrier group with, I think, one, one brigade of Marines is also there. 
has been there for a while before Eisenhower got there. Uh, we have been funneling um, almost 50 cargo U.S. Air Force and Navy jets a day have been going in and out, in and out, in and out, bringing weapons, bringing in men, bringing in things. So it's been this quiet escalation. Um, the um, so So these things are the tangible things that are building that kind of feeling of doom. Uh, or something big is about to hit and a lot of people are feeling it uh, and uh, a lot of and it is a dark energy because it's a desire that the, the mass collective of humanity does not even are not even aware not even conscious of it is that there's a deep-seated feeling in the roots of their atavistic souls is that they don't want to grow they, they, the great change, great unknown change is coming. A great evolutionary jump is coming, and many traditions, many traditions like to give it an eschatological uh, context. Uh, the native peoples, like the Hopi, I, are so literally down to earth that they, they, may, they're very simple about. You know, it's a time of climate crisis. It's a time of heating up the world. A time where nuclear war could happen, heating up the world, and a purification of the fire of consciousness that could purify the world. But there's a whole lot of people that, when faced with change, when it really kind of there's no longer a foreboding, but a situational situation. And of course, we've had a few bits of that with the Ukraine war, with the um, with the war uh, against Hamas and Israel. These these are beginning the manifestations, and it kind of made people go, oh, oh like that, because it's now not just something lurking behind the consciousness, just underneath the consciousness. It's now showing manifestations. And you'll notice a pattern. You'll notice a pattern with the Ukrainian war uh, in different parts of it when it gets worse. Um, there's this kind of shock and foreboding thing. And then it kind of goes down into kind of a, everybody kind of adapts and, and kind of rolls with it. And uh, there's been already, after the shock of the, um, the surprise attack of Hamas, um, there's been a you know that was that's where you saw a lot of people kind of losing it lo saying things they should never say revealing things especially in the israeli government that uh up to netanyahu he starts quoting amalek <laughs> and joshua and all he's, he's quoting amalek and i wrote articles back in 2009 when he was doing that and said said look out for this cuz uh, you know now now he's literally quoting amalek because before it was his press office that responded to ahmadinejad's uh presidency in iran when he said there'll be a day when uh israel will be wiped off the map of history now in farsi it was not they took that and ran with it as an opportunity to exploit that and make it well we're going to we're going to wipe you all out that's what they're planning to do no um the problem is in farsi is there's no there was no proper word for just an end of something like a political context Ahmadinejad in his speech was talking about uh not the one state what not the two state solution but the one state solution that the only way this is going to work is if somehow Arabs and Jews can live in Palestine in one country equally protected equal with equal rights and um now that's an important theme we'll get back to um because uh I'm going to talk further after we look at this part that you're opened up here with this something about to happen in early December and kind of begin to manifest and fluctuate and come out. Yes, there is definitely a couple, two things, uh, two, two of the big wars are coming to their head or, or we're passing the danger. And that's Ukraine, Ukraine, these two fronts of World War III, which have this is so far since the 2022 February has been a conventional war. And uh, hopefully it will remain until it's resolved. Um, so anyway, there's so there's um, so the there's a deep seated feeling that the human race can't even collectively confront, but they will act crazy and say crazy things and and take signs and get fixated on one thing and not see the other thing that's coming. And of course, the press in the world, well. 
the free media, which I and you and I belong to, the, the free or alternative media. Um, y- you can we we'll make our mistakes, but we're trying to really work this out. We're not coming from a, a place of uh, trying to fulfill some state agenda or be a propaganda organ. And that is why we are hunted and, and banned and all of that happens. Because, But thank goodness for one thing that's happened in this uh, shake of, of, the, of the normally unconscious world is things like uh, Elon Musk uh, taking at last one of the big social gathering platforms that's been privatized and literally giving free speech back to it, literally returning it to the people to their constitutional rights where if they, they can say what they wanna say. And I must say they're they're doing a good job, I think with the, here's another view of that, you know, it's, now, now that system where they have the, the three people icon, you know, head and shoulders in blue, just under a context meter. I think they're doing really well with that. Uh, uh, I don't always agree with what they're saying, but it, but they're not. It's not like it used to be, where they just don't make an argument. They don't give you sources. Uh, they just says this is wrong. You know, <laughs> this is non-Soviet behavior. You are an enemy of the people. <laughs> something like that uh and uh, kind of a variation on a theme of that so so that was a huge opening and hopefully it will remain you know the fact that people who've had a very strong influence in uh in the mainstream media have gotten too hot, hot a potato like tucker carlson and now he is he has now gone independent with x with twitter and uh, and then, you know, so more and more people are following the pioneer, Joe Rogan. Well, and before him, I guess we have to say the the Texas guy from uh, Infowars, although I've always found his group to be a, like Mossad, as we spoke in the last show. Um, Mossad's wonderful for gathering intelligence, but they do not know how to interpret their intelligence. It's they're one of the worst spy units for that. But my God, do they know how to gather the info? Well, you know, I used to think of Infowars a lot like that. I think it's maturing. It still has a way to go. But uh, but, you know, I honor their, you know, being out there uh, early and but a little too hair on fire uh, sometimes. Uh, but that's slowing down. Uh, they're getting better. So uh Anyway, the thing is that so we make mistakes. We in, in the in the alternative media, we make mistakes. We're human. Uh, we 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 admit it. Uh, unlike CNN and Fox and other places, which I used to do interviews on, they would die first before they um, say they made a mistake. And and so, for instance, I made a mistake that I can talk about now. Thank God it was a mistake. It was looking like Theodore Roosevelt. And another carrier strike unit were also on their way. Maybe they were, and maybe they just, they were kind of coming towards uh, the Middle East from, from the Western Pacific, but they have not shown up. So I wonder if that got, or I'm just wrong. Thank goodness, because I wouldn't, I, I was thinking Fort Carrier groups, that's, I've said before, that's not a, that's not a, a, de- a statement of deterrent. That's an offensive and uh, so the so that that was my mistake, and now I can we can see how it's uh, developing that the Eisenhower and the Gerald R. Ford are the only strike groups there. And actually, if they're going to war, that's not enough. But um, leave it to as uh, Mr. Obama used to say uh, about the current president, who was in the first pass of that seven passes of Pluto's return. He says, leave it to Joe Biden to F things up. So um, so that's another crisis that's happening, He, uh, which is giving foreboding in the country. Political crisis is brewing. He's done. He's really can't. I mean, he got up. I think uh, in, there was some footage I just saw that at this uh, APEC, not APEC, uh, ASEAN meeting, um suddenly out of the blue he he's in this round table and Z Jinping is 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 uh, on the other side of the third of the table and he just suddenly gets up and starts 
shuffling over, you know. I just I just get something and, he, and it's like they're pulling a what? You know, here's Z saying what? You know, and they were, they were kind of taken aback. And because there was no translator there, um, the the head person of uh, the, the one of the great diplomats after um after um the Russian foreign minister, the Chinese foreign minister, these two, these are like Talleyrand and Bismarck, you know, uh, stature of people in in diplomatic. I wish we had somebody like that in in our world. Um, uh, so he was translating for Biden. I don't know what they were talking about. It was like suddenly he was there, like he's shaking his hand, like he's seen him for the first time. Oh, hello, Z. And uh, very embarrassing. Um, and. You know, you know, uh, the other things that are slipping out is the camera was on our secretary of state the moment when, after all that talking, somebody dropped the truth bomb question, baiting the the uh, recalcitrant mind of uh, Mr. Biden. It says, uh, but you said before, Mr. Biden, that Mr. President, uh, that Z was a a dictator. <laughs> Do you still feel that now? It's a good question. He should, of course, he could see. You see um, Blinken starting to blink and blink and kind of get all nervous and and like, oh, 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 oh. And, then, and then there's the moment where he says, oh, yeah, he's a, yeah I said before, he's, he's a dictator. And the moment he did it, you can see Blinken kind of went, oh, oh. <laughs> like that. It was all over. It went viral. So another indication that that these little actions are like, bringing also to the forefront more foreboding for people because you know um this is this is not normal uh, we have clearly dysfunction is ruling dysfunction in the knesset where people are openly talking well in fact they've been recorded on tape and on video and if there's a trial they'll be tried for war crimes uh for some of the things that many of the leaders of israel have been saying and um, I mean, the real ugly face of Zionism is showing itself, catching out. And, you know, this is also what happens in this darkness. People can't keep the mask on. We can't pretend anymore that Joe Biden has a brain, that, you know, he is a zombie president. And, and that is very dangerous for the world. So, 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 so all those things are, there's a lot of different things out there that are happening but there's also a lot of people getting fixated on things that are look like they're really important but are missing the the rolling creep of where the real war could come suddenly because it's slowly escalating and you know i would not be surprised uh, if uh things really started to pop in december or there's breakthroughs there's also there's also some positive things going on. I mean, um, I must say, Alexander Curious uh, did a was prescient in a number of things he stated. I think back, oh, um, I think it was the thirteenth of August. Or what? Well, sorry, when this? Yeah, it's it's has it been this long? This this war has been going on. My God, of October, thirteenth yeah, October, he started. To, I actually quoted it extensively because I thought it was a very significant statement in the second to last of my uh, articles in the last uh, Hope Prophecy Report, Emergency Report, which was released on the around sixth October or somewhere. Anyway, I, 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 I did uh, record whenever he made that statement, and uh, and he basically was talking about how. You would see a pattern. The United Nations is now becoming significant again. It is uh, a surprise. That's also what happens in these situations. Now people are relying on the United Nations to kind of find a way uh, to fix this. And what's happening is the only place where the world can really show that it's moving away from the American hemorrhage of single superpower reality, which has died, uh everybody's knows it outside of america but the americans are probably going to be the last to become to accept it to face the fact that that era of american history is over and i would add that um if we survive its decline um the future of america after some painful changes is going to be smelling like roses it's going to be a much nicer situation but you know it's just like 
if you want to see a parallel, look at the last superpower that was fighting us in the last in the first Cold War. The second Cold War started in 2014, and now we're in World War III. I would say uh, since 2022, uh, but the but this this uh, the first Cold War um, it was the Russians that collapsed first, and then they went through a period of great troubles, and they eventually all that political world died with the Soviets dying and the whole system collapsed. And then what happens and it will happen for us as well. There will be Pete. We will have our version of Vladimir Putin and his people. We'll have his version of a new America, just like there's a new Russia that most of the Western media is completely blindsided by. They don't want to know about it because it's remarkable what's happening in Russia right now. Um, and it, it's, res so there's, I think there'll be a very, you know, an American version of this, but I, I feel that uh, the only way a lot of these systems are going to, they're not going to be changed from within. They need to collapse. So there's another, you got to kind of it, it, look at the positive potentials of the fact that some things just need to collapse. I mean, you can't fix Rome. You know, when Rome, Western Roman Empire collapsed, there was no way to fix it because it was broken. And so it had to break down. Sometimes in history, that has that has to be embraced because of what it will then bring. It will it will bring an end to the stasis of mediocrity that is going on. And and mediocrity cannot be fixed. It can only exhaust itself. This this neo-fascism that's kind of trying to rise in different countries of the west it will like before it's a fascism is an unstable political idea and uh, what is going on in zionism is another form of fascism uh, it's racist it's apartheid it's uh and the other thing that's very very important to understand is one of the worst things that the zionists are trying to do right now in israel is peg zionism as being synonymous with being a jew it is not there are many many i would say a majority of jews in the world are not pro-zionist i contend that i mean there's a there's a whole movement that except for elon musk and and x showing the world about it because you know the is the israeli lobby is really controlling our government in a lot of ways a lot of the people in the, in the Secretary of State's office are dual citizens. So how can they serve two masters? They don't. They serve Israel. They ser so they serve the Zionists. So, so Zionism, when I, I'm going to write, some, I'm going to publish some articles in my next wave, which is probably going to ruffle some feathers, but it, it's, it's meant to heal the situation and it's, to give context is that uh, is Israel or to be Jewish is not to be a Zionist any more than to be a non-political interested German makes you a Nazi because there are some Nazi Germans. It's um, there's a lot of parallels between Nazism. Well, as I was talking before and I was doing all the quotes of uh, how the old concept of cleaning out the Palestinians and the Arabs from uh, Yezret, Israel, greater Israel um, is, I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize, but the, uh, that, uh, as I was saying, the, the, the how I read um, the moment when the Lord pres presumably gave Abraham, the founder of the Jewish uh, semi Semitic race, he gave them these lands as his promise, but uh, I read it. I was rather surprised and refreshing myself with it. I said, well, it sounds like all of his seed. He's talking about all of his seed. Well, that means all of, you know, if his seed is the seed, it doesn't matter what um, grail, <laughs> Sarah's grail or Hagar's grail, the seed the injection of the seed came into and then the children were created by the mother uh, the wife 
and the serving girl because of the problem of them being so old. I mean, that's why Ishmael was the first son because, you know, we're thinking, well, we've got, we've got, got to have a legacy and Sarah's old as I am. Who's, who's going to say she can have children anymore? And because they were getting old and, uh, and of course the miracle happened and after um, Ishmael was uh, born, Ishmael would have been the lion. It would have, if, if Sarah had never had children and was unable, but then Sarah started having children. And then it was, you know, if saying for, so these are the lands promised to the seed of Abraham. Well, that means both sides of the Semitic race, those that have come out of the mother of Hagar, Hagar, and those who have come out of Sarah. So this idea that, no, no, we're going to take all of it. One Semite group says we are superior. We're going to take, uh, we are, we are the Aryan Semites. <laughs> we are the master race. We are going to do this. And look, there's, there's extremists in every group. I mean, Wahhabism in Islam is heretical to most mainstream uh, Islamic people because it doesn't, uh, you know, the five, the five virtues, it, it, it uh, clearly in jihad does not believe that uh, civilians, if, and this is how bin Laden and Al Qaeda reasoned it. It's interesting logic because his letter came out recently again, came out for people to reread his letter to the Americans. And he, I, I would say he made a pretty good argument in that he said well because you elected these people and elected them to use their force your forces this way and persecuting killing millions of arabs and muslims and well then it is your vote you voted these people in you are also culpable well the problem with that thinking is and I mean, I can see, yeah, well, we are in a way I would even agree with Osama bin Laden to a certain point. If I were, if he were alive and I was talking to him, I would say, well, I get your point. Um, and if there's ever a sin of any democratic nation, it's when its citizens either are slowly programmed to do this or by their own laziness. So I think it's a bit of both is the citizen has to know their rights has to defend their constitutional rights always you, you you go oh everything's free everything's fine let's just go and live our lives have get married have kids to get retirement blah 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 that's all great and it's fine but if the blah 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 is and completely abrogate your responsibilities to remember your rights and to be on alert when you see your governments and your schools slowly taking civics classes out of out of your schools, like started happening a lot in the 1980s, then be aware they want to make you stupid. They want they, to be stupid. Populist in a democracy is to become serfs of, to become slaves, slobs. Actually, the, the term slob comes from, is where slave came from. And, and and serfs, Slavs. Um, so we we so we are responsible. We do all of us collectively have a burden of not taking our our democratic rights. We've took them for granted, and now we're losing them. And and the good that can come out of that is you'll have to now fight back to get them. Uh, you you have to. I mean, the story of why the citizens of the British Empire who did not want to break away from the British Empire of King George III. They, Adams and Jefferson, all these people, when the problem started over the taxation issue about the American Indians before King George, I can understand his logic. He said, we did all this fighting over there in the new land and it was expensive. And I think you guys are obligated to be taxed on the thing you drink the most, tea. And so that we can get our, our funds back because it drained us. I mean, the wars that France and England arguably could have been called world wars because they were fought all over the world. Uh, so one could argue that we've 
this isn't World War Three. This is World War Four or Five, um, potentially. Because if you look at, I mean, uh, the American Revolution was just a part of a major global war that had battles in Pondicherry, India, between the French and the British, trying to see who's going to dominate the world colonial systems, and and the Caribbean. I mean, one of the reasons why the, the fleet couldn't come sooner the french fleet is they had all this fighting to do with the british down in the caribbean to see who controlled the spice and all of that so you know commerce and all is very similar to some of the things that have been going on in our world wars of the 20th century and now the third one in the 21st so i contend so so all that's going on and um the the situation is there's so many ends of this that i could grab at the moment so i'm trying to grab the tail of one of them um so you know this foreboding it's real um it's something i often feel coming up before most people i talk about it as premonitions you call it what you call it it's also a collective premonition over the last, from the mid 2010s on, it was clear that there were there are may there are rising these looming things that and many readers over the years. I mean, I've I've corresponded in the last ten years to sixty thousand people. I mean, I I can't, I can't even count how many emails I've written to people, but that's how I learn, uh, and through the process I learn how to communicate and understand what people are needing. And that's why it's always great to get feedback from people who um, do the readings or that I do or, or to people who subscribe to my Hope Prophecy reports. I always encourage them to give me feedback because that's, that's how I can... I used to be able to do that a lot on Facebook until they started shadow banning me and preventing uh, thousands of people on my Facebook page, but they, they never get notices about me unless it's by some accident. I used to get thousands of people uh, chiming in whenever I notify them that I was releasing another old prophecy report. Now I'm lucky to get five. Mm-hmm. And um, rather than 5,000. And so, but that's, that's part of the problem, um, but it's getting nudged. Um, so what's also another layer of what's kind of disturbing folks is that is things that people are not used to seeing, like the fact that despite all the really harsh stuff that's uh, being thrown out there, people are shocked to hear governments actually um, killing thousands of civilians uh an open genocide and here we have with all this technology and ability to actually see it on our our devices every day and it's like it's right out there it's times the kind of stuff that people like hitler and other would would try to hide uh it's it's right out there and you can watch it as it's happening every day since this thing has started is an act this war of genocide is definitely happening and it's if but now because of that people first getting over their shock and then the other reality is millions of people 50 million arabs in europe and other places are having massive demonstrations london finally had a demonstration that was the size of the one they hadn't seen since 2003 with the iraq war with the unilateral invasion of the united states into iraq um I had friends in that demonstrating in that. It was amazing. And I was seeing the same oceans of people crossing over the bridges to the parliament that has not been seen since 2003. And all over the world, people are demonstrating. Uh, all over the world, people are shocked by what they're seeing. And all over the world, people are seeing that America has a zombie for a president. And they can't hide it anymore. It's just like I've been saying for even before the Ukrainian war started, I was saying, look, they'll, they'll propagate it another way. But propaganda only works at the beginning. And they were winning propaganda war with Ukraine for the first year or more. But then 
2023 started bringing reality to the situation and this finally it finally even the people doing all the lying for their for their governments to propagate to go garbles this thing out with their garbling um they had to face what garble garbles had to face actually i saw i was just by chance this morning i watched one of the last dust uh the last uh um Vulcan Shaw what was it is it had the black eagle the German thing with the rays and they and uh it was the the weekend report the um what's it called I mean there was Das Signal but anyway it was it was a Nazi new re- newsreel and I stumbled upon the last one broadcast on the 22nd of March and it's and it's telling the parallel that this is happening with our own time when propaganda wars have been going on I was not aware, and I went through the whole thing. Is this is this is the, one of the most famous of the uh, the um, Volkenschau um, serials because it it had it started off with guys to uh, taking the bombs. They just had a thousand plane raid from thousand Allied planes, a thousand fighters. Mustang long distance fighters and they had just blasted Berlin. And so they were doing some uplifting things to show this guy who was going and finding all the delayed action fuse bombs and the bombs that didn't go off. And he's demining them. And he's uh, and how what a great service he's doing and saving people and they're blowing one off. And and then it then it goes to something that had been shown separate, but now it was in the final newsreel again in a longer version. It was Hitler. The last time ever anybody in the public world would see Adolf Hitler live is in when he goes to meet all the boy warriors uh, and give them iron crosses because they'd taken out Soviet tanks, and then you know, and then everybody saw what a wreck he was by then. You know, is this? And they they did they hid. You couldn't see his Parkinson's hand. He was holding it, and they made sure they cut off. But there's some raw footage that shows his hand behind. It's just like going, meh, 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 meh. and he's just a wreck. And he's like going, oh, good, good. To each of these these little boys. And so there. And then it was a shot of him walking down with a bunch of soldiers at the Silo Heights when they that was the, the heights where the Soviets came over. Um, um, in this huge battle that was the opening of the Battle of Berlin about uh, 20, 30 miles uh, east of Berlin in April and so they showed that in it and then they showed the other famous one I always thought these were separate but they also showed the uh, the Volkstrom all the, all these poor guys old duffers just like you see in Ukraine now all these you know, 40, 50, 60 year old people uh, being taught how to do the Panzer Faust, even women, we've seen that in Ukraine now, which is also another Nazi state. It's repeating history since 2014. Uh, right? The the Banderite Nazis that used to be some of Hitler's best uh, non-German allies have come back. And they are, and it's funny how, well, it's funny in a tragic way, um, and the crying clown way, uh, that that um you know now now they're i'm actually seeing in the trenches when there's a lot of dead ukrainians a lot of them have long hair and like the russians are like in shock they're like oh what the, what is she doing here well you know and this dead dead woman I and mean, dead young woman probably had only a few weeks training and then there was another amazing bit of footage i saw where there's a woman huddling all alone on some grass in an open part of the dell in some in the wintry area she's all alone there's nobody around the russian soldiers coming up and he's talking and he says what are you doing and 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 then he comes up to her and he doesn't know that she's a woman until she calls out and says i i surrender please don't hit me i'm pregnant and he was like what are you doing here you know, in Russian, he was like, going, you shouldn't be here. You know? And so uh, they left me. And uh, and so they took her and took care of her. Um, the So there there was also a lady who was a press press company, you know, of the Ukraine. And she's all proud and she's she's got her cameras and her thing on her head. And she's all decked out 
armed for bear. And then a few moments later, she's in a trench and being shelled. And she's and she's speaking in English, which is odd. Uh, she starts to be Ukrainian, but then she's also speaking in English. And when she had a shell fragment, it clipped her here. And so she was like dripping blood off her chin. And she's saying, I'm okay, I'm okay, <laughs> in English. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, she, she was there huddling against the... She was having her first experience of a shelling. Ukrainians don't have any shells anymore. Uh, they're all going to Israel. And, uh, but that's another story. That's, there's so many things to unpack for December, but I'll get to them. Um, the, uh, after the 1st of December, um, what's going to happen. So the, there are, there are, the term in Viking is Regnerok, and it is a label they give to their end times, their Armageddon, you know, the burning of Asgard, of Odin and Thor, and and they had their army of the, the Valkyries had brought into them, and they were going to fight the final battle with Loki and his forces, and, um, and the great serpent that rings the flat earth started violently fighting with Thor. Thor killed it, but he got poisoned. He hit him with a hammer, though he got and but but when that happened, then then all the waves, everything started to churn up and major the earthquakes and things like that. But Ragnarok, and then what eventually happens though is that world is destroyed. Odin and the gods are all destroyed, and a great fire and war and all of that and then the the children of balder balder was like this christ-like figure the vikings and he loki when loki was still part of everybody in asgard he, balder was standing there like this angelic figure and they, they were throwing things at him because nothing could kill him and you know they'd throw a big rock and he'd bounce off him and he wouldn't be hurt he'd just standing there and uh, but loki discovered that he could be killed by uh, a mistletoe or something like that so so he found out and then he got uh, his balder's blind brother i think or blind uncle to throw it at him he didn't know what it was and and then balder died and was killed by a little mistletoe in prick um although sometimes they show it much larger but just to make it look nice but i think the story is better if he's just like a little freaking dead so, but he had his children, they survived. His his children survived, and they hid in the great world ash tree that held up everything. And and they came out, and then there was a new era. And in a way, um Wagner comes close to closest of anybody to try to show that in the end of his ring cycle. Um uh and he shows Valhalla burning in the distance, the music is incredible. Uh, like you feel like you're right in the great hall and as the fire grows, 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 and then it comes and burns over the ceilings and wraps around its flames over the circular Stonehenge kind of thing that it's supposed to look like. And the Vo Wotan, the German Odin, uh, is sitting there with his shattered spear of the law. He has all the Valkyries grabbing at his knees and his legs, cowering there like frightened children. All the other gods are standing with him. All the heroes are at attention as the fire comes and it just begins to consume them. And and because the curse has been broken, uh, the ring. And so it was the end, the twilight, the end of the gods. And then there's this huge explosion in the sky, a great flash of, of glowing ash. And then the last theme that's left of all is the language of themes. The curse is gone, all that's gone, and all the theme that's left is this beautiful theme, the um, which is love. Uh, and it's kind of goes, -da -de -da -de -da -da -de -da. And then the new world begins. Be like a sunrise, that all the darkness is dispelled by a sunrise, and it's like a whole new green changed world. Bah, bah. Close curtain.
Now, they don't do it that way, uh, but that's what he was trying to convey. I mean, in his 15, 16 hour, 25 years it took him to write it, uh, these four operas, it opens with the, it's, you know, it's supposed to be in the murk of the Rhine. And then you, you hear the nature theme. And then you start, your attention musically is like, you start to see through sound. Your, your attention rises and then you start hear, feeling the current of the Rhine because you're in the depths of the Rhine. And now you hear... And then as you go higher and higher, your the music gets into the perceptions of the pre-dawn light that's starting to come, like illuminating the, the what would be the ceiling of the surface of the water. And out of the shafts of it, it's going... And this nature theme is now surging full of life this is the creation it's not just the opening of the scene he said this is this is also the creation of the world and so it was it's this whole symphonic thing and then you're seeing these these naked sprites kind of flowing with their hair like cloud and and in the shaft lights and finally one of them sings and that starts the 15 hours anyway so um, we're kind of in a death of one world, beginning of a new world moment. We are in Regnarok. Regnarok in the Viking lore, in the Norse Eddas, means, now he called it, Wagner called it the Goethe Dameron, uh, which is the twilight of the gods, all one word. <laughs> I love the way the Germans do that. Uh, so the, the, so, but Regnarok means the, the breakdown of, uh, established things uh, it, the breakdown of order the breakdown of structure you know it has a lot of different meanings like that it was so one of the things that makes people feel a foreboding is their structures are about to be broken down they they feel it they don't know i'm giving voice to it um it's what you're saying about in this foreboding since um august and especially in october and now it's kind of going to hatch out in early december there it's like breathing out you know it's breathing in and then it'll that's the foreboding and then it breathes out into the into the manifesting world and what it's going to do you can already see the beginnings of it the cracks are there is structures that we've respect america being the superpower for 32 years no one questioned it and what a lot of people want to see it end because a lot of people were not being treated very well when there's one, you know, I always had this hope that what we would do is we would truly live by example and, um, and be there to help if people wanted it, not if, not if it's imposed in this kind of puritanical American way that, well, we, we have the righteousness, we are the special country. So we're going to make a special effort to, up and whatever you are, because you ought to be like us. And what hubris, hubris of empire. Uh, so it was an opportunity that was missed. Um, and even then, it's an opportunity that America can always be as any country. And what I love seeing about the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians is that they have no interest. In, when Biden met and he had a moment of structural shock, when he finally, after all this effort to get Z or C, I'm trying to get Z is not nice in Chinese. I, it's everybody. If you don't say Z Jinping, it's C Jinping, like you see him, because um, otherwise, I guess that's a derogatory term. Z in Chinese, I'm learning. Um, so, um, so he basically laid out because uh, global. Um, I mean, the, the communiques laid it all out. He just said, look, we don't, we've watched you. We don't want to become like you. So he started a polite, but firm and Biden, everybody had to take it. And he was just saying, and he laid it out. He said, he had it all prepared. He said, look, these, what we are doing is we don't want to become a hegemon. We've seen what it does to you. We don't want that. We, we just want to be a nation, um, communing with other nations, uh, 
spreading wealth and profit and and order and stability for the world because a lot of things can not happen in this world but it's also it's not like we're going to impose it we it's always a kind of we're going to live by our example we're we're we want to help people but we're not into changing people like you have been these 30 years we're we're have no interest in dominating the world that that always leads to disaster and guess why you are our example of it and uh, so get that out of your heads we are not involved in that and neither are the russians um if anything um i mean if nato had not encroached upon the russians all these years there wouldn't have been this war and ukraine wouldn't be disappearing which it will ukraine as a nation is going really not exist anymore um, the Russians said, please don't make us have to do that. Uh, but if you guys want to turn Ukraine into a platform for your missiles so that you can shoot uh, a missile at Moscow in, in five minutes, and we have no time to verify if it's a decapitation attack, just like Kennedy couldn't verify a decapitation attack from Cuba. If you're going to do that, then you are turning this situation of your encroachment into an ex, uh, existential crisis for us. Are we, you are threatening all of us, all Russians and all the other 139 ethnic groups that believe that they like to be in, though they're different ethnic groups and stuff. They coexist really well. And, you know, if you, if you want to see an interesting inside story of how Russia is, I would I would strongly suggest you all go on YouTube and watch Ellie from Russia. That's E L I from Russia. I've been watching her for a lot, about a year now. She's this amazing Aries red haired explorer girl, and she she goes all over. Rather than Dora the Explorer, they should call it Ellie Ellie the Explorer because she really doesn't. Um, and she's because of COVID, she spent the last several years, rather than traveling around the world, which she does extensively, she spent most of her time going to all the different uh, provinces, oblasts and states that are within autonomous states that are in Russia. And it's quite an eye opener to see um, as far as ethnic uh, mixing, uh, the Russian, the Russian Federation is and and America are the most melting pot countries in the world. Uh, the Russians, uh, though, is an interesting thing is that people retain their sovereign cultures inside the Ruski Mir, the the Russian world. And um, and she goes to all these different places. I mean, she's also a mix of this. She had a, a Russian father. And she's, uh, and her mother's a Baskiri, you know, a Tatar, which is one of the largest minorities in Russia. And the, uh, what I'm seeing from this and other things is Russia is really handling its different races and people with respect and um, that we don't have in our country. And we could learn a lot from them about that. Now, that wasn't always the case. Stalin did a lot of purging of a lot of different people during that uh, the Soviet period, um, but uh, this new this new development in the world is about sovereignty of nations, not not one sovereign special nation that everyone else has to bow to, um, and in fact, the whole concept of being a special nation is neurotic. Isn't it ironic that the only best friend Israel ever had, the Zionist Israel, is another country that for a time was a superpower that like Zionist Israel, not Israelis otherwise or Jews, but Zionists, Zionist supremacists, um, also think, well, we're, we're chosen by God, so whatever we do, this is our land, whether you're all here or not will take it and this this is finally this ugliness has finally good this the pus is finally out in the air so i'm hopeful the wound can be healed it's been festering this thing and as i was showing to my own shock in my research from the last wave of articles and then i quoted a lot of, i mean a lot of my heroes of 
Jewish politicians who have been my heroes, like Golda Meir and even Yitzhak Rabin, they all kind of suffer, whether it's latent or, or open like Menachem Begin or Gavir, who's might have been culpable in um, in uh, Rabin's assassination. I mean, I've, I have some videos of him much younger where he's proudly showing the Cadillac uh, sign uh, that it's a Cadillac of the, on the prime minister's automobile. And he said, you see this? You know, we, uh, we took this off his car. We, get, we got that close and none of his guards noticed. And I'll tell you, we could get closer and take him out. And guess where that man is now? He's Netanyahu's chief of police. You know, all the all the people getting shot point blank by settlers and stuff like that are not uh, Zionists, but in the West Bank, well, he lets that happen. He's the guy that's running the pogrom. And uh, so, so it's good. This is ugly stuff, but it's good. It doesn't smell good when you lance a wound in the soul of a nation, but it's good because now, even though it stinks to high heaven, there's a chance for the air to dry it out, the air of truth, and for people to have to face things, just like people are having to face that propaganda wars always lose. It takes no Nostradamus to predict that. They always lose when the side propagating the most, because it's the weaker side, starts to lose the war. And then what happens is you can't hide it. They couldn't hide all those, all the months of the famous anticipated NATO armed leopard tanks up the gazoo, you know, already with trillion dollars of NATO weaponry and shells and everything, this great offensive, it's going to happen in the winter. Uh, no, it's going to happen in the spring. Uh, no, it's going to happen in the late spring. Oh, no, it's going to happen in summer. And it finally happened in the summer of this year. And between July 4th to the end of September, it killed 100,000 Ukrainians and maybe only six or 7,000 Russians all of that armament was destroyed. They ran, a lot of their guns were blown up. Long story short, the Ukrainian army, this is the third Ukrainian army that Russia has destroyed. And the three waves of, of, of and they've now run out of men. They've run out of, uh, they're now asking young women to go into the cannon fodder with as little training. And now, they're, as I was saying earlier, they're, their bodies are starting to litter the battlefields of Ukraine to the shock and disgust of the Russians who think this is morally wrong. It's bad enough to lose the young men of your nation, but now you're killing your future mothers of your future nation too? Will there be a future for such a place? It's in doubt. So doubt now comes up. Doubt in a lot of levels is happening for a lot of people. Doubt about the economy. Doubt about, um, you know, the world already has big doubts that anything America does or says is not to be trusted. They're not an honest broker. And therefore, America has put itself in a position where uh, it people don't really know if they can make a treaty with us because we break them. We are not honest brokers. That's how it looks. And, you know, it's right, it's true, and the the way that usually things work themselves out is those regimes implode, and you know this the, the American political system we have is not able to fix itself. It has to go a, a breakdown of its structure. It has to go through a kind of Regnerrook, a Gertodamerum. It and it will. I mean the. The problem, it's, and the others, there's some hard truths that, that are going to come out, already are coming out. Um, you know, all those months of the tanks, not, you know, where was this big success? It never happened. They never even got a few miles into, they didn't even reach the main three trenches the Russians had dug. They didn't come close to them. 
they were just fighting in the approaches. And all this might of Ukraine was destroyed because these poor people were not trained. NATO is criminally, and the United States is criminal for that. They rushed them in. They didn't, they taught them in three months, which takes two years to really train to do complicated mix operations with tanks, planes, infantry, all of that. They didn't. They literally, these poor people were sent in with all this powerful tanks and stuff that they could hardly learn how to drive. And it was a mess. I mean, I watched it. It was a mess. It was, if if it wasn't, it was a clown show, the, the way the Ukrainians were going into fighting because they weren't trained really how to do it. And with all that training that these other people were doing, they weren't training the higher generals of Ukraine. They, they decided they didn't need any training. And so they, they didn't go. They should have also gone to West Point and other places and learn how to be real commanders. Um, but what I discovered from studying the Ukrainian army is that it basically, it's, it's looking through the rear view mirror as it steps into a minefield, marching forward to victory, <laughs> um, they hope. Uh, and then what they're what are they seeing in the rear view mirror the soviet form of officer corps soviet uh where you know nobody wants to take the initiative all the higher officers above the rank and file officers that are in command from battalion up are just like the old soviet union forces used to be at their worst you know, you don't you don't want to make a mistake it's bad for your career and so everybody is waiting for the central command to tell you when you fart or when you don't. And that's not how Russia is anymore. And, uh, and then unfortunately, with all that NATO stuff, they didn't train them to do the NATO thing. When they blame the Ukrainian soldiers for not learning, that's just criminal. When I hear that, I said, no, all you people who say that you should be in jail. If you, if you had sent U.S. American boys and girls into a battle as poorly trained as you trained those people, you'd all be in jail. You'd in fact be be treason. And uh, so I really feel for those Ukrainian guys who God knows they they're they're brother Slavs, brother and sister Slavs, just like the Russians. And people forget they lost about nine million people fighting the Germans, except for the group that's running it today who fought with the Germans. <laughs> Who are killing a lot of them and uh so you know so what you have is you have you have slavs in a you know when the russians look at this war it's a civil war to them they feel like they're fighting they don't want to be fighting this you know it's families are mixed because the soviet union used to mix everybody together and so most of the russians that are have kids fighting uh in ukraine have relatives they call each other there's there's a, a connection that's even much more mixed than the American Civil War because of technology and things. And a long period of, you know, the South never mingled that much with the North. So most of the border states had the worst problems with, and Missouri and all that with the issues. But uh, we're talking about across the board with Russians and Ukrainians. And uh, I mean, even Western Ukrainians, not just the Russian speaking Ukrainians who actually were never Ukrainians, which were somehow put into Ukraine uh, as this new political identity, which was an artificial nation. Um, the people, all the different peoples that were thrown into Ukraine in 1991 didn't really get have a choice. I mean, and so it. It was doomed to fail because it wasn't. Uh, it, it was one of the few countries that didn't just rise out of its own interest to gather its certain nation together to be a nation. These people never had a choice. They suddenly became Ukrainians, and some of the Ukrainians thought that they should run the whole show, the Banderites, the Nazis. And they had a similar Hitlerian concept of, we are Aryan Slavs because we have Viking blood in us, you know. We, we don't have the Mongols. All the Russians have all that Mongol blood. Of course, you know, these idiots uh, have never looked at the genetic maps of what happened, the genetic mixing. And when the Mongols came and destroyed uh, Rus, the, the original Kiev Rus, um, and then went all the way up into um, 
the Scoff and the northern parts into the, what would be the Musco Muscovy duchies. Well, they spread their seed. Uh, Ukrainians and Russians have exactly the same genetic background. There's no the DNA does not make one of more Aryan than other. There were a lot of Vikings that also became Russians, a lot of blonde Russians out there, and it's like it's all perfectly mixed. So this whole idea of creating a, this identity is is, I mean, it's even sillier than the and and more insane than the clear different ethnic differences of Germans and Jewish Germans. You know they're, they're different. The, what's the problem with that? You know, uh, uh, Russia seems to do fine with lots of very different people. Like I said, this lady Ellie, she's a young girl. She's, she's, she's. You can see she's got the horizontal um, uh, eyes. You know of uh, of, of Tartars, and she's. You know, I I'm all for mixing myself. I think I think if there's ever a master race, it's when all the genetic pools have mixed together. I guess I'm speaking from my own bias because I, I think I have half the world in my genetic pool. <laughs> you name it, it's the hoags made love to it. <laughs> so, and that's why they got all over the place because I guess they were kicked out of a lot of countries. <laughs> I know, I'm being silly, but yeah, I mean, it is shocking how many different, I'm, I'm, I'm French Norman is my name. You know, Hogue. Um, my English side is uh, Danelaw, so that's Vikings, it's Norwegian Vikings in France, Danish Vikings in Yorkshire. Um, I have a lot of Ukrainian blood too, Ukrainian and Jewish Ukrainian blood, and German Ukrainian colonists who went in Catherine the Great's period. They colonized a lot of those areas. So the Volga Germans, I have that as well, and the Swedish Vikings. <laughs> so I got. It's no wonder uh, the first mythologies that I wanted to read first were the Norse Eddas before I went to the Greeks and to the Hindus and all the others. I started with the with Loki and Odin and Wotan and Vaslunga Saga and Nibelung and Mead and all that. So, you know, just a crowd. But <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I I remember in college having to read Beowulf, and that was yeah. a fascinating book, you know. Yeah, and. You know, and there's there's different versions of it. There's yeah. there's like the more um, uh, I don't really want to phrase it more closer to the original Anglo-Saxon, like yeah. Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. And I, our teacher read it. And it was like it's totally different. It's like, it is like, so. I, I mean, it's like wow. I mean, you know, there's there's this guy on. Uh, he has long black hair and all. He if if you just say what the ancient languages sound like uh you'll you'll end up in, in his space and it, they i they're actually people who are speaking ancient languages just today i was i was uh learning to listen to latin which is the smallest romance least known romance language it's just in a few valleys in switzerland that play it but nostradamus was talking about a raid on a castle and he it was saying they were speaking in Latin, but it was really everybody says that's the code because of where it was happening and all. And like they got in because they couldn't understand the signals and they broke in uh, in his prophecy. Well, they were speaking Latin, like Aladdin's la lamp uh, with a D. And it um, so he's Italian, this guy. So he was having these people speaking and kids and older people and stuff speaking. And it's so different and more rounded and bouncy. And, and he said, well, I understood this part, but the other part, no. And then there's one where he's speaking, he's speaking Latin, ancient Latin. And he's dressed up like a Roman soldier and he's speaking ancient Latin. And I was, what I found out from him and verified is that um, the Latin that was spoken in the first century BC, first century AD, um, they rolled their R's. You know, this whole British, uh, uh, you know, because Britons were always like the Romans of our time with their empire. So in a way, even the way people speak Latin, it's kind of got the Victorian non-rolled R's. And when you hear it with the rolled R's, you can really hear that this is the mother of all the Romance languages. It's not so dull and stereo. It's it's a, a sterile, you know, it's so who go, who got, you know. It's 
and it's rolls R's and stuff. And, and I could hear uh, Spanish, Italian, French, even a little, all of it, the uh, Roman, uh, Romani, uh, all of it uh, was was there. And as he was talking about how in different periods of the first century, they would, uh, some people, and he said farther north, and he was even talking about how even with Latin, um, the northerners, which makes sense because they have a more Germanic, Celtic Germanic uh, influence, the Lombards were Germans, you know, and and that they don't have the vowel, open vowels at the end of things. They, they won't say Lagorno, they'll say Lagorn, you know. <laughs> And, and since I've been immersed in 16th century French for the last uh, three weeks, uh, doing my last pass on the final 300 quatrains of the um, magnum opus quatrains that everybody knows if they read Nostradamus, uh, it's a big milestone in my life. I've updated them at last. I've gotten through over uh, 1,100 of them um, in the last few years. And now I will update my translations for them from 25, 28 years ago. So anyway, so I was, um, as I usually do, I go on a journey and even I don't know where I'm going next. <laughs> um, some of you love that. Some of you are pulled into it as much as I am. Sometimes the pull is more important than what I'm saying. And I know some people, it really freaks you out. I apologize, but hey. <laughs> All right, if you're still listening, there must be something you're enjoying. <laughs> no, <laughs> Maybe I'm you're sure enjoying that. being frustrated. Why won't he come back to this and that? Well, that's how I am. Um, well, you know, the thing is, is that's what people need to, you know, like the shows that we do, it's not, it's not scripted. No. You know, and a lot of it is, is just these flashes of, of thought and you try to, you just. You In a river it, of thoughts. You, yeah, yeah, you surf it. And, you, and sometimes. What it surf, it is, surfs up, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then sometimes it dies down, and then it, it catches another wave, and it just it's. Yeah. You know, um, and I think these I these types of around. shows are better, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? You know, I just think these types of shows where it's not scripted at all, it's it's much better than these these shows that are scripted. I remember going on uh, the glass. I think his name is Glasgow. It's kind of a lower channel smaller channel but you know it's 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 a bit polished with mm. the editing you know mm. so it does go through a whole pre-recording and then a you know a post-recording editing kind of thing and um but it's scripted you know there's like you know there's a monologue that he's reading from and there's mm. you know and then some people prefer that kind of show you know i, I, a certain I don't form. I, I yeah it's I just, a certain I prefer, form I mean, if I were to do a Nostradamus documentary the way I'd like it been done, I would write down the whole script, rehearse it and do it and play Orson Welles and the man who saw tomorrow, only go where he left off. Hmm. Because uh, that is the, the litmus test of all documentaries, that 1982 thing that he did. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that someday I'll play the role of wells with all the footage and and i i would have to write the script out i might make changes and stuff and variation but i'd follow script on that so there's there's a place for that i'm all for that and there's also a place for round round get around i get around, <laughs> i get around the narrative all over the town <laughs> and so do you sing on other people's shows too yeah you do okay <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, I can't. I'm an opera singer. I used to be an opera singer, so uh, sometimes I even go full classical. <laughs> there's, there's other people though that um, that have been sensing something that I've been sensing. Yeah, it's all over. And and you know, I just, I don't, I just feel like there's, there's a very, sh there's very little time to prepare between now and December first yeah. to really benefit from this energy flux well in fact it is it kind of gets back to when i from the last tangent is um you know i'm saying how you know people are feeling more upset by change if they can kind of look at it in a, neither for nor against as true meditation is where you just see it as it is and see how as it goes and as it changes and from that kind of witnessing of it without 
judging or, or trying to figure it all out, there's a certain intelligence that's required where you just simply observe it. I mean, I think Krishnamurti said one of the highest forms of intelligence is mm -hmm. to not assess what you watch, but just watch it, be one with it, see it, show its full nature to you, its catastrophe as well as its potentials. And we are living in a world where, the, in, especially in, in the West, well, what they're living in the other part of the world is a lot of hope, you know, where there's also a lot of hope in the world. But I think us being in the West doing this, we're in the we're in the part of the world that's not on the right side of history right now. We're we're we had our show. We had we were the hero in earlier times. But if you're if a country lives its life cycle long, long enough, it becomes the black hat. It becomes the fascist. It becomes um, the nation that has to be sat on by the rest of the world. Now, what can often happen is when you lose such conflicts, um, you do not suffer the curse of victory like America did. Uh, when you win it all, because God, we won it all in World War II. We were one of the last countries even left standing. I mean, we literally had to use some of our wealth to rebuild in the Marshall Plan and other plans, the destroyed world that happened from World War II so that we could have business and commerce and currency. You know, just having the money with nobody else to sell it to because they're all living in ruins. So, you know, it was a pragmatic thing as well as a very beautiful thing that the Marshall Plan was done. And it was also, and I, I'm all for different dimensions. It's the right thing to do as a human being. It's the right thing to do to invest in building your customers by helping them to be come back into a civilized state rather than a stone age and so that was very wise and in on all levels as well as pragmatic and practical so but you know our america went astray uh when for the first time uh, in any of its wars, uh, America did not do what it did like at the end of Civil War or the end of World War I, to just cite a few issues, but we did it in every war we were involved in. We'd go back to a civilian economy. You know, we'd marshal up our soldiers and stuff and fight a war, and then we'd go back home and go into peace and start making prosperity in other peaceful ways. Um, but what happened was, again, one of those unknown new elements that hadn't happened before. And at the end of World War II, we were going to probably do that, too. But there was a problem. You know, the Soviet Union and the United States were kind of uh, going to Cold War. And that created over... And Eisenhower warned that this is very dangerous, this creation of a military industrial complex, you know, if, if, if the Cold War is long, and this was 48 years long, so two generations, what you end up doing at the end of it is if you end that Cold War and suddenly there's no, you've, most of your creativity has gone into preparing for World War III and sometimes fighting little proxy wars or direct indirect wars here and there and so and also preparing for a big collision in nato against the warsaw pact and actually by you know that was when we could do things like old big powerful things with our mixed operations and all that the last kind of glorious bit of that was this whole dust up with Saddam Hussein in 1991, the Persian Gulf War. That's the last time you saw the United States, half a million United States soldiers, and another 100,000 of a dozen other nations, including Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, um, Syria, and others, all being involved in a major mixed operation into Iraq and Kuwait. Um, but since that time, America let those muscles go atrophy. They let their industries be sold off to China. It's not China's fault. They weren't asking. They weren't coming here to buy it. We sold, we came there and sold it to them. And certain people like Mitt Romney and others who almost could have been president made a lot of money dismantling our industrial base. And to be fair, Bill Clinton 
I remember when he was talking about it. He was saying, we're going to be a service society now. We're not good. And he was trying to argue the idea that you could actually get along without an industrial base. And, and I was just sitting there going, that is just dumb. That is not going to work. And it didn't. And it's going to take us 30 years to fix it. And that means a lot of kids who think they can have be in a service society. No, you're going to have to build some muscles and go back and build things. You know, it, now I was in the tail end of it. So I did a lot. Of, I was, I was blue collar as well as white collar. So I, I think that filled me out in experiences. Frankly, I think, uh, I could see it then. There was this whole idea that to be a, a blue collar person was somehow less than a human being, like a Palestinian, in a Zionist nation. I mean, um, there was this guy who used to do the dirty jobs uh, shows. And he's always been a champion of the working man. And he was telling a story about how, you know, he was like, well, I don't know, I might want to be a plumber, I might want to do this, and they were trying to talk him out of it. No, no, you need a desk job. No, you'll make more money. I mean, there's no money in doing that. But he was like, he understands like I understand that it's, it's just different kind of intelligence. And these people might be able to push papers, but can they build the, the skyscraper they're doing it in? You know, do they know how to, you know, they can use the tap and flush the toilet, but they know how they work? And what are you going to do if there's nobody who knows how to build toilets or plumbing and you just got your nice cushy job with no toilet, no electricity, no building, you know, you can, you can go and learn fatten your head with knowledge in the ivory towers of this country, but don't forget the people who raised those into the sky for you and gardened and helped the ivory grow over it. You know, there's, there's a loss and this is what's coming back home to America the way it used to be. And that mean, not that it should ever go backwards, but if it's going forwards, it has to go forwards. And this will happen with a lot of pain, like any birth can be painful, but the child that's going to be born of this, if you remember while all the pain is happening, there's some beautiful babies going to be born in the latter half of this decade into the 2030s of the difficulties that are coming because I mean, what's helped me immensely to kind of understand the blows that happen in life, collective blows from what's going to happen to us with the economy, with these wars, with the climate, and all these things is that I find that when I understand what's happening it really takes most of the identity, which is most of the sharpness of pain away from me. I simply see it as it is and as it is going. That doesn't mean I, that doesn't mean that I just sit there and go, yep, you know, and let it just be that way. What happens when in my life is that I become able to convey unusual ideas and uh, talk about these things like I'm talking to you. Now, I don't think a lot of you who are listening and watching this uh, has somebody who will just kind of embrace the fears and not kind of give you, oh, it's all going to be good or God's going to come save you and all that. No, I don't give you that. But I also try to give you an alchemical approach this all this dark base metal of unconsciousness and potential destruction and racism and Zionism and Nazism and things that seem to be rising up in our world again. Um, I try to tell you how it happens and why it happens, because I have been a watcher of it all my life. I have been interested in being a witness to history as it's being made, as it's coming in from the future as it came in the past. And through that, I, I've gained, I contend, um, an understanding of why the blows are like this. And it is, it has given me, it has given me a peace through understanding to see that, because what is watching all of this changing? 
what is watching the mind trying to work it out? What is that that watches the heart when it wants to cry about what's going on now and, or wants to be afraid of what's coming next and feeling insecure? What is watching it that stuff as it is and as it goes? The more I try to understand beyond the dogmas of what's right and wrong, what's really going on, and seeing how things that appear wrong can have a right, like, yes, it's terrible. You're going to lose your freedoms in America that people fought and died to, to protect. They're going, but how else are you going to refine them again and rediscover your American rights unless you lose them? So now you're going to have to have your own revolution, hopefully peacefully. That's what I want it to be. But you will have this revolution. We are entering a period of revolution. In fact, back to the the seven swipes that are going by. I started off in 2021. The, the inauguration of this first term of this presidency of Joe Biden is a catalyst for the breakdown of all of this. Because whether he was picked by others, frankly, I'm still asking people who say there was nothing wrong with the 2020 election, how they can help me fix this mathematical problem when you have actually more people voting than were even registered in the country by tens of millions. Please explain to me how it is that tens of millions of people who are unregistered as voters voted in the 2020 election. I mean, I don't have to get into the, I can be Alexander with the Gordian knot with that. I don't try to untangle that thing. I take out my sword and go, whack. And that's a sword cutting the knot question. Why, why were so many people voting on both sides? I mean, Trump won more votes than any repo any president in history, and he lost. There was something wrong with that election, and it has karmic consequences. And you know it's wrong when people are suppressed, when people are shadow banned by the powers that got into power, and that's both sides of this uniparty is running this there's no two-party system it's a uniparty it just you know it leans this way and that way a team b team but it's the same bunch of shysters and plutocrats um and you and we have surrendered our american democracy to them because we have allowed ourselves to go stupid to look and blink as people in our communities, politicians were taking away our civics classes, and leaving you unable unless you have, you know, I mean, this is my job. I go studying and researching all, but if you've got a, a job and you, you've got a family and all that, you don't have the time to, but you do have the time to read the constitution. You do have that time. It's only, 4,400 words. You can read it. You can read it. And, and they have the time to read your periodicals. And the, well, the witch? <laughs> and they have the time to read your periodicals. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Prophecy report. Chock full of fun, too. I, I try. I don't make it all. <laughs> it's, uh, in fact, you know, I, I try to put humor and funny stuff into it, the more things get dark. But so, so try, live life like an alchemist. See the base metals as, as an opportunity to turn it into gold. Just remember the word devil and divine comes from the same Indo-European source, dev. Um, if you if you feel like you're getting possessed by the devil, it's probably all of your deep unconscious things coming up. If you watch it, it turns to the gold of of, of understanding. And I speak from experience. It happens. It happens when you stop trying to fix it with the problem, your mind, this mind that's been created by society. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a disciple of Osho Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. So I'm a disciple of what people used to call the free sex guru. 
and people go you were you were with that free sex guru and and i said yeah we didn't pay for it yeah it was free <laughs> and they'll say you brainwashed and i say i've said this before on almost each show because i keep saying it because i hope you guys will hear it because there's nothing better than to have a clean brain to wash it every moment making each moment a new and fresh experience and not be burdened anymore with all the crap every life that gets stuffed into this head all that crap brain dirtiness is the problem of the world if the world was brain clean washed clean with each new moment living in the moment this new moment this new moment, then all that learning loses its identities. It's, it, it, all those voices that sound like your mother, your father, your priest. And all. I mean, if you listen to the blah, blah, that's going on in your head. Um, and it's a good thing. First, when you start, you have to listen. And, and what you'll find out is, is absolutely insane. And Osho used to get people saying, look, since I started watching my mind, I'm, I, I'm going crazier. I said, are you really? Are you this mind? If you're watching it, you know that the mind is not you because you're watching it. So he said, let, let it go mad. Let it be Frankenstein running off into the forest. It doesn't matter. It's just in your head. You are not your head. You are this eternal consciousness. And it watches the mind. Of course, it's going to be a mess at the beginning. And you're going to see, and it'll get noisier because you've been suppressing it. You've been ignoring it. You've been trained to do that by the brain dirtying process called getting an ego, a personality. Persona means a mask. This mask is what society wants you to wear, your original consciousness, like an original face that you never see because you're always seeing out of it the world that is not this consciousness. So in watching the world, you become aware of a deeper wisdom, eternal wisdom, that's as ubiquitous as a wave fighting and comparing itself with other waves, infinite waves on the surface of an ocean, that one day, one unguarded moment, suddenly realizes, I'm the ocean. All this, wa this water that's inside me that I'm always fixated on my outer shape as a wave. If I just start looking in at the water, the depths of water that is shaped, it's the same for all shapes. And where the shapes are impermanent, they live, they die, and they live and die again. The ocean is eternal from that place begin to watch the shaping of your mind the shaping of your and possessions uh the ownership of your emotions and your my thoughts and your dogmas and all of that which you'll start to see that well that which is watching it is not these things this is what you brought into this life and that is what you will leave this life with that consciousness that ocean when this wave that you're playing as, whether it's big or small, it dies back into the ocean. It goes back to its source. Most people don't, they live and die without knowing the source because it's so just immediate to you. That, and this is more important than anything that I've been talking about about the world because you can't fix it with the problem. The mind cannot fix the mind. It can only understand the mind. And through that understanding, the identities that make it insane, make it a perfect servant for that which never changes in you, which is eternally young and forever new, the oceanic eternal soul, the one soul of all things. And 
you can call it many other things. And in fact, to even call it anything is a step away from its truth. Eventually, you understand that you don't even talk about it to truly experience it because you are it. But it's so ubiquitous. It's so all around us that an ego focused world is always out there trying to find it and will never discover that you cannot find something you already are. So this poor suffering humanity who was trying to d decide who's the chosen people of God and who are not, and then deal with them. And, you know, the people who are then put in this kind of victim mode who are being dealt with all that, all that play acting begins to be seen. It's good to see the mechanics of what is making things so foreboding and in our world as foreboding as the first contraction of a mother who's never had a given birth the first breaking of the water the first contraction that seems to be a, a mind of its own there's the world has a lot of the feeling in a travail of history like it's in now where things are happening and you're out of control The illusion is that you've always been in control or seeking to be in control. There is, in reality, control, which is other side of the coin is out of control. This thing that witnesses it is beyond them. It is free of them, but in the form world, it plays with them. It lives... It lives in its temporary visiting into this world of, of transitory change. And so all things that are strong and mighty like America, well, in another few years, people even forget America was even strong and mighty. Um, and then something new comes, something new to see as it is. And when you begin to see things as they are, you're able to respond to them with your consciousness and love. And that's the, that's the key when you're not doing anything. You're simply, you're, re you're responsible because your consciousness is freedom incarnate. And therefore to be free, this is what we've missed in this country. The, the, the reason why we're going to go through some difficult travails as Americans is that we took our freedom licentiously we 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 took it for granted we didn't we forgot the lessons of the past again i was talking about all the founding fathers and a few mothers too like abigail adams they all they they were initially fighting with uh george the third in england uh, saying they were fighting from the point of view as we are not even thinking about revolution. We, we are British citizens of the American continent. We are part of the British Empire. But it evolved because there was no way to come to Concord with Parliament or the King. The unthinkable had to be thought. And so all these men and some women who were never even imagined not being part of Britain, the family of British nations and empire, had to think the unthinkable. They had to break away because freedom was more important than whatever collective identity that they had predisposed themselves to identify with. Freedom became more important. And with it, the, the, the beautiful burden of being response able and thus went this whole difficult process with all the fighting and then finally to create the constitution of the united states in the 1780s um all the lessons that had not been learned that had gotten all of these people to find a freer life even from written uh you can if you read the bill of rights it's a it's a it's a sub-narrative to all the history of this country and all the tyranny that people were suffering in the old country. And now we are the old country, and now we're being tyrannized. 
just like they were. So I know it's scary. I see the fear coming up, but it has no hook in me. And I would even contend for those who are witnessing, and you all can do it, you already are it. You just need to step out of the way and let it happen. That's the work. Uh, this is your true nature. You will feel things. You will feel. You will feel things more vividly. The highs, the lows, but you will also come to understand is it is the hook of identity that makes you suffer. The pains, the fears. You know, it's the hook that says, "What's going to happen next?" What's going to happen? You're already not dealing with the situation. You're not responding to it. You're thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow when I'm on the streets, when I when my 401k and the derivatives crash that's coming has suddenly made my mortgages a uh, hundred percent more expensive, and I can't retire. I have to keep working. Things like this, a lot of things like this are coming to all of us, and the art, whether you've lived as a wave well or not, is is how your consciousness is able to respond, response ably in the moment to these things. You will find that everything that you've learned and experienced, and I'm speaking from my own experience, is that when you're coming from that space, where you're not actually trying to make things happening, but you're seeing the situation clearly, you will find rising in you spontaneously the responsibility, the ability to respond. You will spontaneously get an idea. You will go, oh, well, why don't I do this? And, and you, you will find it effortless. Once you stop trying to push the river and trying to pull the grass out of the ground and trying to pull the butterfly's wings open so it will dry faster when you're actually crippling a butterfly, you're gonna drown in the river and you're gonna end up having no grass in your backyard. That's why things don't work, because people are trying to make things happen and they don't know themselves. They came in knowing themselves, but it was so ubiquitous they it was easy to corrupt with ego. The problem is not your bank account and these things. The problem is being an ego. And maybe, maybe some of you who are listening to this will never understand that. And that's such is the case. It's neither it, this or that. But because it, I'm asking, and I know what you're going through, because when my master was talking about this, I was like, I just don't get that. Huh? I, it took me a long time to come to understand that the greatest effort is effortless effortlessness that enlightenment is not something to find you're already enlightened the question then is how did you lose it whether it's one life you believe in or how did you lose it every life that you reincarnated in if you believe that how did, it doesn't matter if it's one life or many I mean, as somebody who is experiencing my past lives, I've come to this strange paradox. I've actually found people that I was in the past by like uh, lamas trying to search for the next Dalai Lama. I did the same Tibetan technique using history. I had memories. I wrote them down. I stuff that I didn't understand. Why? Why would I see it this way and all? And then I, over time, discovered that I, in other lives, I was doing that. And I, I, it all kind of came clear. So, so what I learned, although when I discovered I was other people in past lives, and, and when I discovered that, I also discovered that I would be other people in future lives. But I also experienced that I have never been anyone that I lived before or anybody whom I will live as. Because enlightenment bliss does not reincarnate only ego and misery collect collects together 
sometimes broken up. Sometimes it gets distributed to other new waves. That's why people have only fragmentary memories of reincarnation, past lives, because that's kind of how it happens, because that's not who you are. The real you is never incarnated. Even though you've been under the dream of doing it a million times, even if you face every time you face death, it's the first time. And every time you've been born, it's the first time. And you keep repeating the first time a million times. And when that hypothesis, because don't believe what I'm saying, don't disbelieve what I'm saying. If you believe in what I'm saying, then you're already trapped back in the mind. Doubt. Doubt everything I'm saying. Test it. See if it's true for you. That's, that's how the real mysticism preaches. It doesn't tell you to buy what I'm saying as an authority figure and believe it. I'm dead set against belief. Because belief is ignorance, qualified ignorance. You know, it's like Obama saying, be the change that we can believe in. Well, everybody goes, wow, that just gets chills and all that. But if you step back and consider it, what was actually said was a load of nothing. Change is not defined. Believing in a change that's undefined. You might as well be Hitler saying, Deutschland erwache, <laughs> awaken Germany. Well, okay, awaken. I mean, we're talking about two, we got the Obama gog and then we got the demagogue Hitler, you know, and it's like, they, and they're really good at using words to get all people all roused up. I mean, the yes, we can speech rivaled things I've watched Hitler do. And uh, very different things they were saying, but fundamentally a demagogue so it is no different whether they're Hitler or somebody nicer like Obama. Um, they are They are lost in their own rhetoric and they're very good at it. And they and what they maybe they're not even aware of it. But if you say something open, vague, like you're putting up a mirror and saying, This is the change that I believe in. And everybody's seeing their own face in the mirror. So they're seeing their own projection of what that change is. So every there's not a single person probably in that audience that believes the change that Obama believes or Hitler believed by awakening Germany. But they're all happy. They're in a mob mind, a bunch of sheeple. They're all going, yeah, believe, yeah, I believe in that. Let's go beat something up or get pitchfork this or that. Well, but no one's, because a mob doesn't think. The, the largest force of unconsciousness in the world is when people think it's a mass, which means they're thinking, their consciousness is, is um you're trying to spread uh, this much uh, mozzarella cheese on one of those record-breaking 500-foot-long pizzas. <laughs> it's just going to be a lot of dead, unconscious bread if this is all the cheese you got. You know, so a mob is just like that. A mob is a big, is a big loaf of bread with no cheese. <laughs> and and so it is a power of quantity. This darkness that you're feeling, this, this foreboding that you're feeling, is the darkness of unconsciousness. And it has a quantity, immense, infinite quantity. But it is not quality. It, consciousness is quality. If if the whole darkness of space in the universe cannot douse out in its vast quantity, douse out a small candle, then the candle has more power than the darkness. And metaphorically speaking, this witnessing consciousness is that candle. And the more people that light their candles, the quantity of darkness is counterbalanced by the quality of consciousness and love. And so that's what has to happen. 
if you want a, a world that really works, start becoming a witness of, it, of them, start to understand it, start to question everything that you've been conditioned to say, well, this is the, the reason that happens and this happens. Take it as a hypothesis that any authority figure, a true authority figure who has the authority of experience, as I contend to be, will not want you to believe me. But the authority of figure, you can always you can always smell it in each kind of authority figure that really is just borrowing knowledge and doesn't know anything. They will want to keep you under their grip. Oh, don't think for yourself. Uh, follow our preacher. He says you got to do it this way. Follow. Him. It's got to be that way. This is how Democrats are supposed to think. This is how Republicans are supposed to think. Yeah, sheeple. Yeah, they're all different kinds of... You're not a sheep. You are a man. You are a woman. With the potential of sentient consciousness. You know, I, I live in the, in the country, so... I have a lot of sheep friends and undulates of different species, cows, and sometimes I talk to them. They they seem to look back at me with much more wisdom, and and so and sometimes what they say is perennial truth. Moo. Especially if I sing to them, they all come gathering up. I sing to them, and they just go. <laughs> when, I, when I was living when I was living in Lipstadt, Germany, for I was working on an automotive project, and Lipstadt has only about twenty thousand citizens, right? And there's a lot of there's a little bit of an industrial area, but just outside the industrial area, there's farmland, and there's just cows all over the place, and mm. in Germany literally they had cowbells on the cow mm, yeah. so when the cows were roaming around you could hear in the distance the cowbell we put so, cowbells I mean, on our our cows yeah, our dairy cows yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, it's just it, and you know coming from detroit you know being a detroiter <laughs> i mean I, <laughs> oh my god I, I mean i was just like never saw a cow with a cowbell before <laughs> i mean we we did go to a farm when we were in like elementary school to yeah. milk a cow but i mean that was you know it was just like a, you know, a field trip kind of thing. Very but. powerful thumbs if you do it. I got because <laughs> I had to milk this cow who had wasn't really milkable anymore, Maybelline. But we, Maybelline. To, <laughs> yeah, we named her Maybelline. Yeah, we had one little cow bull named Buddha. But uh, uh, anyway, that's a whole I mean, you story. know, I start telling, one of these shows, I should tell all my farm tales. <laughs> from a bunch of crazy people with Osho and red red cowboy clothes all all out I there with own. the cows. And now I was the pest controller of the whole commune, all 64,000 acres of it. I called myself the Lord of the Flies because <laughs> I had this jar full of flies. It's a, in the Rajneesh Times, they had a shot of me with the jar and I'm posing. <laughs> Sometimes it shows up on Hope Prophecy every once in a while. I put it up there. And there's all these flies going in my fly trap and I'm going, Wow. <laughs> and yeah so yeah so I, I everybody started calling me bills above you know I I was, lord of the flies you know. i can think of only two of the field trips when i was in elementary school it was one was at the at the bagel and donut shop that was local they showed us how they were making the, you know the, the the donuts and the bagels and then the other one was the field trip to milk the cows. And that was, uh, you know, I, I, all the other ones, I don't remember. I don't remember. But you had a, a major experience in Deutschland. Right, right. <laughs> With the cows. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, it was strange going to Germany. You know, it was, it was the first time I ever flew on a plane. Wow. Right? So it was international flight. Yeah. And, um... And another thing that kept on playing in my mind was, you know, my ancestry, you know, they all left, you know, the ones that survived, you know, yeah. all left and, you know, made a new life in the United States. 
And I just, you know, going back to that, just kind of, it was kind of, I just felt there, I felt there was a, a taint of the land or, you know, the, the, there was too much blood in the, in the soil. What a lot of Israeli Zionists should be feeling right now about Gaza. You, they become, we become the thing we hate if we're not watchful and loving. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, we definitely need more peace in the world. But I have a sense. It comes I, from non understanding. It will only come from understanding all the non-peace, why there's non-peace. And it, it can be understood. And then when it's understood, even if you can be peaceful, even if the whole world is going mad around you, you can be like the story of when Pompeii was erupting. And everybody's freaking, the ash is falling, the pyroclastic flows are on their doorstep, everybody's running out of Pompeii. But there's this old man, old philosopher with his staff and his dog, just walking their same walk that they do every day. And everybody's like, oh my God, I ripped the hair out over there. And he's just, as the stones are falling, he's just serene. Um, this will all be part of the test, you know. Um, there's a taint on Israel right now. I mean, the very thing that's happening happened in Germany is now happening in Israel, and it's changing the whole way the world looks at Israel. That ultimately is going to be hard, but it's going to be, well, it can be a whole renewal of, of, you know, greater Israel, greater Germany, what's the difference? And people can just, just be, be a righteous human being following your path and live by example, not by, not by preaching and not by see the light in everyone, you know, not you know, question whether in so many spaces, especially people with a Zionist mindset. I mean, look, the, the Germans were looking for uh, the Aryan race, which was the core of civilization. It, they couldn't find it because it isn't there. You know, but they were trying to make this whole idea. Can one just step back and say, why am I trying so hard to make something up here? <laughs> why? And the other thing, too, is that we do our best to remember what the teachers of the past have said. But some of my own teachers thought was very important when he was alive was to leave a not just a written record, but a video record of what would have what how would it have been if we all could see videos of what Abraham really said? And to see Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and to actually see them, not just in the print in the Bible, but to actually see them as flesh and blood people, if they had videotape. I mean, if I were doing a short story, I think I would have a guy go back in time and teach Abraham how to use a videotape machine. <laughs> now, do the family pictures now. And, and whenever you feel like talking about something, talk into this. So then in the future, we'll really know what you said. And not what we do our best to divine out of the dead print. Because the print is all we have. And thank goodness we have it. But do I have Abraham's pregnant pauses? Do I have him give a look? that makes what he says maybe going a different way than what the dead word can't make it do. These nuances are everything. So like Osha kept saying, I want to film me, tape me, audio, everything. He's the first great teacher to do that. And so, so, you know, we can, and, you know, even now there's, there's a lot of struggle going on in my own community, spiritual community, um, a lot of people are seeing what turned Christi Christ's message into Christianity or, you know, turns Abraham's message into Zionist supremacism. You know, it's um, 
and uh, but we're armed with the actual here's what he said <laughs> you know here's him talking about it here's you know what you're saying is not what he planned to do and so in a way it also is a very effective way to from now on using this technology or even better technologies to record things even feelings is the next thing that could be recorded is because of these technologies if they're misused they make a police state of the world but these same technologies if they're used with wisdom and love they they will make it impossible for organized religions to take the living word and being of a, their founder or the living word and being of Abraham, the founder of the Semitic races, and turned it into this mess, which could destroy the world. And in fact, there's there's even some projections in many religions where people are pretty happy, like John Hagee, you know, the big Christian evangelicals, they're, and they're they're all thinking, wow, great, we're gonna destroy half the world. That means the Messiah is coming. <laughs> And as my rabbi friend, rabbi friend once said, you're waiting for your antichrist? We have been suffering us for over 2,000 years. <laughs> we had a good laugh. <laughs> so not, that can't happen if you have a record of everything. If you're actually, I mean, right now, my mass has been dead since 1990, but you go on YouTube, put OSHO into the thing, and he's going to pop up all over the place in different discourses and things. You'll get to see the person I used to sit with. You might actually feel something that I felt being there, because I, I, whether it's in three dimensions or two dimensions, the presence is there. And I say that from knowing him, being his night watchman, in his house and and knowing all these years of of his absence i mean he was a a man who was absent inside now he's <laughs> it's like the the zen story one of my favorite because i was real close to my mom and i and we were both disciples and i was wondering how i was going to handle you know her not being in my life because we were so close almost like one person and um but i often he one time he talked about uh a there was a Zen monastery in Japan, and there was a one of the monks who was taking care of his mother. He set up, and the guy had her made a little thatch house for her. And he, whenever he could get away from his duties, he would feed her and take care of her. She was getting old, and because they were very close. And then the day happened when he had to burn her with the with the wood of the house on it to make a makeshift funeral pyre. And burn her, meditate, and take her ashes and disappear it into the world. And, you know, they were looking at him. It didn't seem like anything had changed. But finally, some of the monks asked, well, how is it for you now? You're so close to your mother. How is it now? And he said, well, the meditation was presence of mother. Now the meditation is absence of mother. I know exactly what he's talking about because my mother left this world in 2016. It was a very beautiful death. And the absence can be even more intimate than the presence of things. See, for me, my mother just keeps on haunting me. Mm. <laughs> Especially during the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um well thank you john you know we've been going for i don't know over two hours here you know but what's good is we never got to december what's happening next uh, all i did was prep you for it and that's exactly the right way because if we went back to that now and maybe you know a couple of weeks i can be back on you know in december and then we will have nothing but that to talk about but <laughs> well i, I didn't think actually i didn't actually say anything <laughs> after december 1st <laughs> that much yeah, I, yeah. So, you know, what we'll do is we'll do another recording, you know, to, to go into more detail. But, um, yeah. you know, I just, uh, I definitely have this weird feeling about, mm. about this, this, this cloud that's, mm. and it's tied to this, the month of Kislev. And that mm. there's, 
this divine flux of I, can't, I don't know how to describe it other than a divine flux of energy that starts mm. starts it's a reckoning with Kislev, Kislev, and then that it's coinciding with with Hanukkah. And and I would add, when a few hours ago I started talking about, I can it's come back to me is that what that Pluto return stuff uh, we are now in from the sixth to the seventh, and it's going to hang there. This kind of old foreboding is going to hang from October 10th to mid-October next year. Because this final pass, it's almost like six and seven pass are the same. They're so it's so close and slow that Pluto is hanging over the world with this with this energy of great change through the destruction of the known so that the new and better can come. And so um, we're never completely out of the conjunction. It just is either a little more magnified to exact than just a few degrees out, which is still very strong. So it goes from this October 10th and number seven is just before the American election. Well, what's really strange, John, is this that in Zohar on page two, 112b in numbers dealing with the parsha of Balak. All right. So numbers, so there are parshas, weekly readings of the Torah, mm. right? Within the five books of Moses. Mm. And that there are detailed explanations within the Zohar for certain parshas. So it happens to be the parsha in numbers, Balak, on page 212b, which is the back page in Zohar dealing with the sixth day on the on the 25th day of the sixth month there will be a sign in the sky seen over Rome first and that will start a 70 day countdown and after that 70 on the, after the 70th day um, then what would happen is there's supposed to be the Messianic era. Mm. Now, what's weird is what do they mean by the sixth month? Yeah. My interpretation, because it's a Hebrew text, that it would be based on the lunar calendar. Mm. But yes. there is something there's something in the history of the lunar calendar that I don't understand. It seems like there are two start points the start point that i know of makes elul the sixth month which is now, which this, is in the english month uh well it co coincides usually it runs uh september uh, yeah. yeah september yeah september around september so um well this this seventh thing to interject this seventh thing is just a few weeks after that the final seventh pass is in the first two weeks of october next year well what's weird is i can't when i use the hebrew calendar i can't find a date where it it coincides on a friday i can only find it to, to coincide on a monday a wednesday or a saturday okay. and that's the weird part about it it's well, that's because Monday. it's not a specific date. I would say it's it's a it's a it's a window in time. Hmm. Because uh, from okay. my astrological background, you see the a lot of a lot of what happens is that um, things don't happen suddenly. You know, it's not twelve midnight on the year two thousand in December, and then the next morning on January first is the new millennium. Um, these ages blend. You know, the Aquarian age has been influencing our world since the time of the Enlightenment in the 1770s. The same Enlightenment uh, founding fathers and mothers of America were were educated on that. It was very important how they established modern democracy. So that was the beginning. And that's when they tar started talking about how all people, all men are created equal. Well, that's a start, at least half the sex well, the world is equal now we gotta work on the other half um and then that happened a few hundred years later closer in the aquarian age the age of the humanitarian um and now the new 
the new evolution of all men are created equal or all people are created equal is everyone is equally unique. That is true Aquarian, full throttle. The Aquarian age is about individual, undivide you all, sovereignty. And ironically, the way I'm seeing it now for the things that are changing, the people who want globalism are just trying to make a one world Piscean age, which is dead. Centralization is was the glory of the last 20 centuries. It has achieved its centralization of everything, banks, grids, mindsets, religions, organize, everything's all organized and fine. You know, all the middlemen are there, everything is fine. But the age of the Holy Spirit that Joaquin de Fiore in the 12th century AD saw uh, is the age, is the final 20 centuries of the mission of good news on earth, according to him being a Calabrian monk, Catholic, Catholicus, well, the, the, the universal, you know, which actually contains everything. I mean, there's two different kinds of Catholics, the ones that try and take the whole universe and blow it through a straw. Those are the dogma people. And the others who kind of take it bigger. So that's why Nostradamus had no qualms uh, mixing his Jewish mysticism with his Catholic mysticism because he was a small C Catholic, big world. Now, the... Um, there's another date the middle man the, the last we... three centuries was the era of the epoch of the middle man we gotta go through this group to get to that the Aquarian age in the next 150 years will erase the middle man and now everyone is individually sovereign so the, the world will the world through nations will distill the smaller and smaller and smaller until one day there are no nations. But this is not globalism. It, it is a world full of each human being is a sovereign nation unto themselves. And people will live in that community of sovereign people. And that that's when we finally full on the twilight zone between Piscean and Aquarian is over in another 150 years and then sometime before that hopefully but by then we will be living in an age of science to know is what science means not to believe piscean age was about believing in centralized authority um that and it's interesting to see how even in the kabbalist movement um and in some mystical christian movements they're already talking about like the third temple is not something you build or coming out of the sky for my last set of articles i did find a picture of it coming out of the sky <laughs> it's in, well, there uh, are you, there are some rabbis that you know say that, uh, that i know it's, it's i know like, well it's in they, they have a, i have a nice picture the second yeah. article has this nice epic picture of the, of the temple coming out of heaven but there's also those who say that this, this, and this is more germane or more in the mind of Joaquin de Fiore and Kabbalists, is that the, the you find the divine by looking in. It's God is there waiting for you. You don't have to go through a middleman. That's at least what it seems. The decentralization of things is what the Aquarian Age is about, to put it succinctly. Okay, so thank you for coming back onto the show, John. So what we're going to do is make sure we get people to click the, that link that's yeah. in the description, get to your website, take a look at your periodical, sign up for it, and you do readings so they can sign up for a reading. But please, everyone that's watching this, please click the link, go, go and help John out. Yeah. Sign up for his periodical, and uh, you'd be you, you know you'll get informed on some of the 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 current events that are happening, and we're going through tumultuous times for yeah. sure. And the other thing too is in 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 the delivery in my writing is very different from what I do in these shows. I mean, then you'll see it chapter and verse right there, sourced everything. It's like you'll have a f the flow is detailed. It moves clearly one from one thing to another according to 
was needed in the articles. And, and sometimes there's interjections of humor. There's some, I always managed to find for free some amazing illustrations um, to put in them. So thanks to uh, Creative Commons for that. Um, and um, it's... Uh, and, you, you know, check them out. I mean, I've set it up at hookprophecy.com. You can find how to get a reading from right at the very beginning. I have information there as well as as well as at the end of this. But if you want to visit my website, um, I always have the first few articles free. So you get a feel. And then there's a little excerpt from the next uh, with an illustration. So you get a feel of, OK, this is what you're reading. This is the other stuff that just five dollars a month is an automatic PayPal. You can go through my website, the link is there to PayPal. And for getting an automatic payment, you can get every every month at least two waves of articles. Um and and then uh, you or if you want to do it all one, you know, all 12 months, it's just sixty dollars. You know, I try to keep it as low as possible in the hope. That works if people um, see the advantage of that and seeing that I'm trying to reach a lot of people by keeping it uh, cost effective. I mean, my my price for readings as a famous celebrity, uh, I'm I'm rock bottom with what I do, but it, it has to be amount, a certain amount to make it worth my very precious time. And I give everything to you in the readings, just like I'm pouring out here, only it, it's a different, it's more intimate and really a lot of fun. I've always amazed the people I attract into my little Zoom screen. And and um so yeah, just check it out. Uh it, it's it's so important because uh you know we don't have CNN's money, money budgets, all those alternative media people. We it's, it's amazing to see people that like Chris Hedges and others that are used to be on all those shows and now they're banned. And, you know, we're all trying to make ends meet and we're actually giving you, I contend, you just check because uh, what I do in my articles is I access you to all of my sources and I invite you to check the sources where, you know, I take a lot of what the world is giving me and I give it that prophetic angle. That's what I do. Um, but I have layer upon layer upon layer, very interesting men and women who many of them I've been, have been sources of mine for years. I haven't met any of them yet, but I, uh, I encourage you to check them out too and help grow the financial capability for our very much besieged world of truth tellers uh, well, propaganda mongers um, to give you a porthole of what's at least a fresh look. You don't have to believe what we're saying. You shouldn't. Uh, CNN wants you to believe them all the time. I mean, they're the most trusted name in news. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's um, I'm not going to say that that malarkey to you i'm just you're going to find out whether i have intelligence or not and or my sources and that's how it should be well thank you for coming on to the show john and everyone remember the links are in the description of this video and all the videos i've been doing with with john just click the link it's at the very top of the description to get to his website it gives all the information about getting the readings and please help out by purchasing his, his products. So thank you, John, for coming on to the show. And you know, you know how it is. You have to yeah. wave and say goodbye to everybody. Yes. Goodbye. I love you all. All right. Let me stop the recording here.